Sometimes in life, hard decisions have to be made. Sometimes you reach a fork in the road. It could be a key deciding moment. Not sure exactly what we should do. I like the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens, written by Sean Covey, so Stephen Covey's son, that talks about the importance of a small decision, the younger a person is, has such big implications. So if considering a, a younger person's life, if the train is starting out in Los Angeles, a decision of just a little bit will end up changing if that train is going to end up in New York or in Florida. So the longitude, longitude of a decision can have an impact. I also like Yogi Berra's advice about what to do when you see the fork in the road. You pick it up. You take it. You take the <laughs> fork in the road. It doesn't directly relate. But I said, when I looked to go find that quote, I forgot Yogi Berra said this. Baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical. <laughs> so anyway, today's message, I've titled it in a multitude of counselors. We're going to talk about how we can all make better decisions by seeking counsel. And we can consider it from two different lenses, two different angles. The counselor and the counselee. Most everybody in this room at some point, and even the little ones, will have a chance to be a counselor of some sort at some time. All of us could also be counselees. I thought of coming up with three points, counselor, counselee, and responsibility. I thought that had a nice rhyme, but we'll keep it simple. It's just two points because responsibility is on both sides of the equation, the counselor and the counselee. So what we'll do is we'll first of all just start with the foundation, provide a little bit of framework, and then I'll have three points for the counselees to consider and three points for the counselors to consider. And I also just have to say, I enjoy visiting with so many people here. They're such a wonderful group. And then to have uh, dear friends, the Whitlarks have moved here that we knew for so long ago. And it's got to hit them a little funny. It's, it's me funny to hear Mr. Josh Cook because he was a little guy uh, not that long ago in some of our memories. Anyway, and thanks, Josh. Nice job. But let's start with the framework. There might be three different Proverbs that come to mind. So let's start with one. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14. Where there is no counsel, the people fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. In the New Living, it says, without wise leadership, a nation fails. That there's safety in having many advisors. So guidance is giving direction and counsel, good or wise advice. We understand that failing is, falling short, wasting away. Safety is deliverance. So in a multitude of counselors with, uh, can deliver a nation successfully without wise leadership, a nation fails. Proverbs 15, verse 22, similar theme. 15, verse 22, without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. In the NIV, it says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. And then the final, the third proverb that's right on with this theme is Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6, where it says, for by wise counsel, you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. So here's three different proverbs. They all say multitude of counselors. Now, a couple of them have different angles. So here it says, you want a multitude of counselors before going to war. I don't see any generals out there. I don't think any of us are going to war. So I'm not sure exactly how this relates to us. Another one said nations fail without a multitude of counselors. But I don't think any of us are presidents. I don't think any of us are leading a country. So really, it's like, where does that fit in? Well, another one says success. So ultimately, guidance and success is tied to a multitude of counselors. So let's take it a step further. Should we always have a multitude of counselors? It depends. It depends on the topic. It depends on a few things. But let's also turn to Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 20. So sometimes it's a multitude of counselors. Sometimes it's just simply counsel. So 19 and verse 20 says, listen to counsel and receive instruction that, you're, that you may be wise in your latter days. So let's go to a definition. The word counsel means to give advice. And I found this definition. There's a website called Hebrews12Endurance.com. Hebrews12Endurance.com. There's a lot of neat things there. But what it says is the, count, the word counsel means to give advice, providing information, so that another person can make a decision based on the data provided. 
Here's a question. Does every advisor get, give good advice? <laughs> no. Just because a person's giving advice doesn't mean that it's counsel. certainly doesn't mean that it's wise counsel. So some people can offer advice, misleading or dangerous. It could be intentional. It might not be. But wise counsel is what we should be seeking. Wise counsel is advice given by someone of maturity, wisdom, or experience. They have the right skill set and enough knowledge to provide guidance that ultimately then will help the counselee make the right choice. So now let's dig into counselee. Three items to consider. Point number one, seek an expert. All advice is not created equal. Consider who it is that you're seeking advice from. Consider that it's seeking an expert, or it could be plural, experts. So the point could be seek an expert, and in parentheses, the letter S. So the wisest counsel of all would not be controversial, God. You can seek advice and counsel directly from God. James 1 verse 5, we won't turn there. We'll try to conserve the scriptures we turn to, which is still going to be quite a few. But James 1 5, seek wisdom. Ask for wisdom from above. God the Father, mighty counselor. He can provide wisdom and guidance. And maybe one of the questions that you would ask God is, point me in the right direction for a good advisor, for a good counselor, to then help provide additional information. So seek advice from godly experts, start with God. But now let's turn to John chapter three. So with, with each of these points, I'll highlight an example in the Bible, either good or bad, that has to do with seeking advice from as a counselee, as we'll start, and then we'll go to a counselor. But John chapter three. I like the Mr. Smith from Florida that said, this is the original Nick at Night. So it's a story of Nicodemus. I did some extra study on Nicodemus, and I'd encourage any of you to dig deeper into this. Nicodemus might be Nicodemus ben Gurion. We know he was a member of the Sanhedrin. We don't know all of the members of the Sanhedrin. Out of 72, we have about 55 that are identified. There's only one Nicodemus that's identified. It's Nicodemus ben Gurion. And if you think, if you like the Israel modern history, there's David ben Gurion, same spelling. So Nicodemus ben Gurion was known to be one of the master teachers in the Sanhedrin. So if you want to dig deeper there, I'd encourage it. But anyway, he's a master teacher. Where did he go for advice? Nick at night, he goes to Jesus Christ. So there's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God because no one else can do these signs. So he's seeking advice or counsel. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus didn't just leave it at that. He then said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he end up the second time in his mother's womb? And then Jesus responded. So Nicodemus could have gone anywhere for advice. But for him to become a master teacher, he had to have been a master student. He would have had wise teachers. He would have read a lot. He would have talked a lot. He would have thought a lot. But then he chose to go to Jesus Christ. One other little tidbit about John 3, likely at that time, they would have been on the rooftop. So they would have been looking over Jerusalem at nighttime. And that's when this conversation would have happened. And if you continue through John chapter 3, this is what turns into John chapter 3, 16, one of the most famous verses. So the highlight here from a counselee perspective, seek an expert. Here, Nicodemus was an expert academic, uh, academian at that time. He was an expert uh, teacher, leader. But he went to Jesus Christ, and he didn't just simply ask a flattering question. He asked a question, and he asked another question, trying to learn. So consider what makes a wise counselor. My daughter's going through, uh, she works for a big company, and they have these promotions and all these uh, efforts uh, as a part of being promoted. You have to write what your job accomplished this past year to then be considered. So she got advice from two different people. One person... The very first time they wrote their advice, they got promoted to the exact job that Samantha's hoping to receive, that she'll learn about pretty soon. Another person tried three different times, didn't really work. So she got advice from both. Now, if you have a choice and if you're in a situation, would you overweight the advice or recommendation from one side of that equation or the other? And if so, which? Well, it should make a lot of sense, right? But so as we seek advice, seek a wide variety of advice, depending on the topic, 
but also weight the advice based upon the expertise of the person being asked. We were traveling recently, and I saw a part of a movie I hadn't seen for a long time called Dumb and Dumberer. Not that I'm really <laughs> recommending it, but Jim Carrey would never be a person I'd be seeking advice from for anything <laughs> in, in, as that goes. Turn to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 on this topic, please. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20. Where it says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. So as we're seeking expert advice, walk with the wise. I've shared a quote many times that is still meaningful to me, especially at summer camp. We become the average of our five closest friends. That's true for many of us at all ages. So consider who are your closest friends, walk with the wise, seek expert advice if you're seeking counsel, when that would be appropriate. It would be apparent to some of you where this next verse will be going, but let's go to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. There's another source to consider for expert advice. My son, listen especially to this, Josh, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Here's what I'm trying to highlight here. Your parents know you better than anybody for those of us that are blessed to have parents. Now, my father passed away this past summer. I'm thrilled that mom is able, we have a nice conversation on the way here. We have our in-laws. So for you, those of you that have parents, consider that as an expert area to seek advice. Now let's take it a step further. My father was an ag teacher and a farmer. If there is a question about something mechanical, how to make something work, how to grow broccoli as big as a plate that was really flavorful, how to help, help kids that he called the kick-out kids, so kids would get kicked out of school, get them on a track to get a GED. He could get a kid that was really failing in school a GED very quickly through how he was able to help teach and relate. All of those would be things that dad would be an expert at. Now, my father-in-law was a professor at Ambassador College. He taught a class on comparative religion. He wrote a book on comparative religion, and he's a marriage and family therapist, counselor. So my dad was not a marriage and family counselor, but he was a great mechanic and farmer. So each person can have expert capabilities for depending on what their talents and what their level of interest is. That could explain why Terry Dishinger might have been one of the best Purdue basketball players ever. But then separately, my mom really was the person that helped raise our family. And I have three siblings. And many times people would explain to her boy, what wonderful children you have mom really put the work in so if any of you would be thinking about child rearing questions how did that work how did the family go and there's people here that have very happy successful families think about that moms help feed and, and take care of so many people separately my mother-in-law she became a specialist in cooking syrian food she's german but her mother-in-law was syrian she has a baklava recipe that was for a long time like double top secret but she might, if you'd be really nice to her, show you or help you how to make baklava. She's also, she loves to play cards and she can be a little feisty. So we have a nickname of the Black Widow for her. <laughs> she has earned. But if there's ever card advice, maybe she would be a source. But what I'm trying to highlight here, nobody is an expert on everything. But most people are an expert in something. So consider who the person is, what their perspective is, but then where to go get advice. I had some more notes in there about mom and dad and Situ and Jiddu are the Syrian names for um, the in-laws. I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it that trying to keep it very complimentary for all and, and just we'll, we'll move on. Actually, one last thing on this note that I don't think, my mom's heard this story. I was dating a lady named Jan in college. Her father was a professor at college. Before it got really, really serious, I went and had a talk. It's like, I just want you to know, I'm interested in your daughter. We're starting to date some. I said, well, that's nice. You're a senior in college. What do you think you're gonna be doing after college? Talked a little bit more and then he said, where do you think you'll live? I said, really, I don't know. So I had just come back from Sri Lanka. I lived there for a year and there was some interest and talk that maybe I would go back there to lead the project. 
And he's like, oh, no, I don't think you really want to do that. I think what he's really saying is, you really don't want my daughter to go to Sri Lanka for that long. So, um, but that was one. And he's like, so w w where else do you think you would live? Said, well, we, we were through Colorado, uh, up driving out to college. That was kind of a neat place. So maybe it's not California, it's not Indiana, where I grew up, it would just kind of split the middle. He's like, well, uh, really, most people should choose one side or the other. But if you live in the middle, then you're not living by anybody. So that was a counseling advice, certainly with some uh, built-in uh, preferences tied to it, but the consideration of him being a marriage and family therapist, him saying, if you really want to grow up around family, Colorado is not going to help you with either side of that equation. So I thought that was, that was wisdom, so thank you. Okay, item number two, seek counsel, not agreement. Seek counsel, not agreement. So we've said that sometimes we want counseling to be a multitude of counselors. Sometimes it's an individual counselor. So baptism, marriage, personal problems might be best to be an individual counsel if it's a trusted expert. You could change a counselor if it's not meshing or it's an issue, but it's not a matter of going minister shopping or counselor hopping to find somebody that agrees with what your preconceived idea was to then just seeking agreement because that's not really seeking for advice. So let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12, let's pick up the story where just after Solomon died, 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse three. We'll help if I'm in 2 Kings right now, so let's go to the correct area. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse three. So Solomon just died, Rehoboam, then starts off with the wise comment. So 12 and verse 3, they called Jeroboam called the whole assembly of Israel, spoke to Rehoboam saying, and, and this is um, right after Solomon died, your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burden of some service of your father in this heavy yoke which he put on us. So Rehoboam said to them, and this would be the elders that had been serving in Solomon's court. Rehoboam said, depart for three days, then come back to me, and the people departed. So now, why would it be a good thing to say, depart, give me three days? Sometimes people get forced into a decision that they don't need to be forced into. So if you can slow down, give me three days, give me a little bit of time, let me think about it. That's actually a good and smart response. And in, in our family, we say, well, sometimes, why say or when you can say and? So sometimes it's a false choice if you are forced into an or to do an and. But so let's continue on. Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon. So I would imagine that those elders would have been some of the smartest people around. Solomon was brilliant, right? So if this was the group of elders that were in Solomon's court, they probably had some good advice. They said, how do you advise, or he said, how do you advise me to answer these people? And these elders spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Brilliant. What did Rehoboam say? He rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who had stood before him. And he said to them, what advice do you give? So this was shopping for an answer that matched what he had already wanted to do. So when he said, give me three days, it was actually a good thing to say, give me three days. Let's think about it. He heard the elders give the answer. The elders gave a really good, smart answer that Rehoboam would have been much better off if he would have followed. But instead, what verse eight says is he highlights that he rejected the advice. He rejected the advice before he even heard what the young people were saying because he thought they already had it figured out. So what advice do you give? And then the young people go through, don't lighten the, the yoke, let's make it difficult. So the highlight here is the decision was made that he wasn't really seeking counsel. Rehoboam was seeking agreement for what he wanted to do. And he already had it set up with the young people who were tied to him. Also consider that when you're seeking counsel and you're trying to find a, a, what's the optimal path, it doesn't have to be a vote. It's not like if 10 people say this and one person says that, the 10 people are always right. The contrarian investor highlights how the Dutch tulips in the 1600s, everybody was flocking buying tulips. And if you don't know the story, I'd encourage you to read it sometime. People were going into debt to buy tulips because the prices were going through the roof and then they could sell it. They were making so much money. 
And it was just an incredible thing for a little while until it wasn't. <laughs> then people realized you can't eat a tulip. You're not really getting much benefit from the tulip. And then people stopped buying the tulip. So then the great tulip crisis disappeared. But there could have been a multitude of counselors at the time when the prices were going up for the Dutch tulip bulbs that would have said, this is a great thing. You've got to get in, mortgage your house, get everything in. This is your chance to make a lot. People lost and got hurt a lot with the Dutch tulip crisis. So sometimes it's okay to be a contrarian. But just know if you're going against what a lot of people are saying, you've got to be really convinced that you're on the right path. Item number three, listen, consider, then apply. Listen, consider, then apply. And I'll encourage us to make hard decisions. Also to realize that if we don't make a decision, that's a decision. So simply stalling and not making a choice is a choice to not decide. So no decision is a decision. Be willing to make hard or difficult decisions when needed. But then you can ask for guidance. Light my path. Smooth my path. What's the best step or the next thing for me? Let's consider a couple of Proverbs in this line, and then we'll talk about a highlight of the story or two. So Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 15. Well, verse 15 of Proverbs, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. So sometimes if we're going in considering that we're seeking advice or counsel, we might want to consider that our own initial thinking may or may not be accurate. So be willing to consider that there could be wise counsel to follow. Verse 9, uh, chapter 19 of verse 20 of Proverbs so in this theme of listen, consider, then apply, 19 and verse 20, listen to counsel and receive instruction that you be, may be wise in your latter days. So here's the word listen. So listen, receive, and then you may be wise in your latter days. Then we'll go to Proverbs 17 to um, amplify this just a little bit more. 17 and verse 10, rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. Now, to me, that verse didn't say a whole lot until I read it in another translation. It says, a quiet rebuke to a person of good sense does more than a whack on the head of a, few, of a fool. But, well, <laughs> that, that's good. So consider, listen, consider. Maybe it's a quiet rebuke. Maybe there's instruction coming. But then uh, consider the action. And then finally, 17 and verse 24, it says, wisdom is in the sight of him who has understanding. But the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. And another translation that I like says, the perceptive find wisdom in their own front yard. Fools look for it everywhere, but right here. So sometimes wisdom's around us. Wisdom's in our own front yard. Wisdom could be for a topic right here, depending. So let's highlight um, a story in 2 Samuel. So 2 Samuel chapter 12. Listen, consider, then apply. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. So the context, the story of David, Uriah, Bathsheba, 12 verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. This is 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. The poor man had nothing except one little lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children, ate of his own food goes through the whole story that we know. And then all of a sudden, it says uh, in verse, well, let's continue in four. A traveler came to the rich man, refused to take his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. But David's response, he was angry. He was upset. He said, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold of that lamb because he had done this thing and because he had no pity. And then here's Nathan's big response. You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king. I delivered you. I gave all of this. And now here we are. And then the, the, the verse I'd like to highlight uh, to wrap up this chapter is verse 13. What was David's reaction? I have sinned against the Lord. We know the story from here. So the highlight is 
David did listen. He listened to the story. Nathan told the story very effectively. He considered it. And then when he learned it was him, he applied it. He said, I have sinned. Psalms 51 is a great outtake of this story. There's a gentleman named Dr. Ken Keis, K-E-I-S, that has a website that talks about seeking wise counsel. And I thought this was an interesting point. It says, make seeking wise counsel an intentional and regular part of your life. Push the envelope to approach individuals at new and higher levels. Proactively seek wisdom before you need it. I liked a book I read a long time ago that says, dig your well before you're thirsty. Proactively seek wisdom before you need it. Learn how winning individuals think in order to achieve results similar to theirs. And wisdom's about context. So there's more information. If you'd like to look on site, uh, online, Dr. Ken Kais has some interesting I I items or thoughts. Okay, let's transition now. So we did the counselee. Now let's change the lens to the counselor. Now, each of us could have different times in life where we are then a counselor. Could be as a parent, could be at work. People that you work, you work with, you work for, you've established a skill. Could be a life skill. Could be a variety of things with how we could be a counselor. Could also be an older brother or sis uh, sister. So it could be a variety. So from the lens of the counselor, point number one, listen. Really listen. Listen, really listen. Now, this might not surprise the ladies in the room, but for you men in the room, did you know that if a girlfriend or a wife is sharing that they've had challenges that day, they're really not looking to be interrupted. They're really not looking for somebody to fix it. They just want somebody to listen to it to start with. Now, that might not have surprised the ladies. The men, that could be eye-opening. <laughs> um, the reality is, I didn't really understand that early. That's still something I could uh, consider more frequently. Uh, I did read recently in a doctor's office. So doctors today with fee-for-service, they're having to turn patients so quickly. The average amount of time before a doctor interrupts a patient, 11 seconds. <laughs> that's, a, that's the reality today. Now, uh, for relationships, certainly we need to listen, really listen. And, uh, and to consider this. So for the example from the Bible, I'll, I'll highlight, um, I'd also have us think about a book, maybe some of you have read or read to children, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. The Horrible, Terrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. If you think of somebody in the Bible who would best exemplify a no good, horrible, very bad day. Turn with me, you might already be there, Job. So let's start with Job chapter one. And let's think about this from a listen, really listen perspective. We won't go into all of the details with Job. But we just can start with in chapter one. Job was blameless. He had seven sons, three daughters, had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, oxen, donkeys. He had all kinds of things. He had all things working perfectly for him. He was blameless. We know that Satan came and said, well, if you consider the um, a conversation with God, I'm still not sure, quite sure how that works. But uh, if you consider Job, there's none like him on the earth, a blameless upright man. So Satan says, well, does Job fear God for nothing? You put a hedge around him. You've given him everything. He has all the camels and all the donkeys and all the sheep. And he's got a wonderful family. So he says, let, let me... Uh, let me add them, basically. And so then, in verse 16 of chapter 1, while he was still speaking, fire of God fell from heaven, burned up the sheep, the servants consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And this is where the horrible, no good, very bad day just keeps going. His children die. Everything's dying. Everything's getting torn up for his entire life, except his wife. And his wife then gives the wonderful advice that was not advice. First God and die. That would be one of the worst possible days any of us could ever imagine. That might be the worst worst day a, a human's ever had to go through. I don't, I don't know. How, how do you compare? But then as we continue on, let's go to chapter 2 and verse 11. So this is the high watermark of Job's friends. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon them, each one came from his own place. 
Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, one of the shortest people in the Bible, if you like to know, <laughs> and Zophar the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. When, and when they raised their eyes from afar, did not recognize him, because now he had boils as well. They lifted their voices and wept. Each tore his robe, sprinkled dust on his head. They sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Listen, really listen. They were there for seven days. Now, this continues on to um, chapter 16 and verse 1. So the high water mark was his friends went there and they were quiet, gave him seven days of peace, listening. I, I can't imagine he didn't say a single word. They, they uh, likely listened to Joseph. But 16 verse 1, Job says, I've heard so many things. Miserable comforters are you all. <laughs> they accused him. They said, well, Job, didn't you know that you can't be blameless? You're really the problem. You need to you know, re-examine your life and see why you lost all of your family, why you lost all of your livestock. Miserable comforters they were. I will say... Uh, some of us can be miserable comforters sometimes. I asked Samantha's permission for this. As many of you know, she's had some seizures and had some health problems. She's had a couple of people come up to her and say, well, you might want to just consider what it is in your life that you need to repent and change from because you know, maybe that's something. Also, there's been a lot of people suggest essential oils can solve a lot of things. And I would agree that they might be a good thing, but you know, we need to consider who's putting us in place of being a counselor and are we an expert? And if we're an expert, be sure we share. But if we're not an expert, let's not be like a Job friend who's a miserable comforter for a person going through challenges. Oh, another person said that, I understand exactly what you're going through, Samantha, because my neighbor's dog had a seizure. And I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that doesn't necessarily apply. Um, so on this topic of listen, really listen, I'll go ahead and share the story. I was, I'm in college. I took a psychology class at Bastard College with Dr. Albert, who was on the telecast for a while. I was working at a period school, so I came in late to class, or like right at the edge. So I was sitting at the very last row in this class. I have a good friend, Brent, sitting next to me. And in psychology class, he was practicing a, a, a thing that's called um, paraphrasing. And he says that as a counselor, you want to listen, really listen. And it's really important to let the person speak. You want to really understand what's on their mind. And so we had to do these practice paraphrasing. So he would give an example. A 45-year-old man, his wife just passed away. He's lonely. He's wanting to counsel. He's wanting to talk. So what do you say? So then... You're supposed to paraphrase, and so if that's the role play, then it would be very sorry that you've lost your wife. This must be a very lonely situation. What else would you like to talk about? Or you just kind of paraphrase back a little bit and then just let, let them keep going. But we kept doing this paraphrase exercise for a while. I was a junior. I thought I had a lot of life figured out at that point. And it just hit me. It's like, well, why would... We always just be negative and just like somebody tells me something negative, but I paraphrase it and so to say, you know, something negative back. So I raised my hand and said, well, wouldn't it be appropriate sometimes to just say something positive? Dr. Albert looked at me, pointed at me. He had chalk. He threw his chalk at me. The chalk came flying through the science lecture hall, hit just above the top of my head. And he started on a rant and he said, that's the problem with youth. You went black and white, cut and dried, yes and no. Do you know what that man has? He's lonely. He's sad. What are you going to have him do? Join a local bowling league? He's still going to come home lonely at night. What are you going to do? Have him put out 10 plain truths a day? He's still going to be lonely. The person needs to talk. You need to listen. And you can paraphrase to then allow that listening to begin. I still remember that to this day. The chalk has an honored place on my bookshelf at home. <laughs> and mid rant with Dr. Albert doing this, and he was he was blowing fire. My friend Brent reached down and put the chalk on my briefcase. He goes, I think he wants this back. <laughs> I didn't take it back to him. Um, anyway, so that's the Dr. Albert story. So we should um, listen, really listen. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 27 is the final uh, verse on this topic, or this point. Proverbs 17 
in verse 27. He who has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. So we think about this point to start off. Listen, really listen. Men, ladies don't want to be interrupted. They don't necessarily want things fixed as soon as they start talking about a few sentences. Let's consider how we can listen, how we can paraphrase, and make sure if somebody's coming to you for advice, understand what the question is. Understand what the issue is. Think about some of the background, and don't just jump to an answer. Let the explanation happen. Item number two to consider if you're a counselor. Are you an expert? We talked about seek expert advice, and maybe multiple experts, but consider for yourself. Are you being asked to answer a question for something that you know? Or are you way out over your skis? I would encourage anybody to talk to my father-in-law for marriage and family uh, counseling. I'd encourage you to talk with him about comparative religion. I wouldn't go to my father-in-law to help fix my car, but nor would I want to fix my car. My dad was a good mechanic. I don't like mechanics. I, I didn't say that right. I like mechanics who can fix my car. <laughs> I don't like doing the mechanical work, the physical labor. The I, I used to, on a farm. I used to be able to be able to do that. I can't do it that good anymore. So it's like figure out what's your skill set where you're at. I was thinking for a, a question here. If I had a really long calculus problem. A really long one. There's X's and Y's and equal signs. And if I gave this to everybody in the room, who would I want to get the answer back from? Gosh, he's a senior in biochem in college. Now there could be a wide variety of answers. There's probably only one correct answer if it's a really complicated math problem. I used to like math, but those days are way, way past me. <laughs> a little story about Samantha. When she was a senior in high school, Josh had an eighth grade math problem, uh, uh, homework. And so it's like, oh, Josh, this is how you do it. Let me help you out. The next day, Josh comes back. He got an F. He missed every question. <laughs> so at that point, we banned Samantha from being a math teacher, Josh. <laughs> but Samantha's brilliant in other things. Actually, in college, also a, a, a kudos to Samantha, she became a math tutor for some of the students that sent her while she was at, after she completed the math uh, school. So she's good with math, but she's even better with other things. If you need a PowerPoint presentation done that looks really professional, that's Samantha. She can do that incredibly well. If, you have a, if you're looking for a, a heart to help the underdogs, the people that are going through challenges, neurodiversity items, she, she is a leader in a group called Best Buddies that just does incredible things. So everybody has different sets of skills. I'm looking at Jan. She has reinvented herself from a stay-at-home mom that helped focus the raising of her children to now going back to work. That's a hard transition. So there's everybody can be an expert in some things, but nobody's an expert on everything except 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 16. So let's go for 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 16. The man named Solomon. Why is this man? So he would be an expert, I think, in everything. So we know the story of 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 16. Two women, they were harlots, they came to the king. And one woman said, O Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house. I gave birth when she was in a house, and then it happened the third day after I'd given birth, this woman also gave birth. So one house, two babies, and then one of the babies died. This woman's son died in the night she, because she lay on him. I rose in the middle of the night, took my son from my side, and now the question is, whose son? Solomon's brilliant. So let's jump ahead to verse 24. Solomon's response was, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. The king said, divide the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son. She said, oh, my Lord, give her the living child and by no means kill him. But the other said, let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. The love of a mother is supposed to be like absolutely no other. Solomon knew that. Solomon had this whole example to then ferret out which one is the real mother. Let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. So the king answered and said, give the first woman the living child and by no means kill him. She is his mother. So that was the old, uh, you know, uh, uh, murder mystery back then, Solomon solved it. Solomon solved it by coming up with that example. 
and then watching their response. So are you an expert? Can't be an expert in everything. If you're being asked to provide counsel, listen, really listen, and then consider if you're an expert. And if you can help with it, great. If not, there's a couple of things I'd advise. I don't know is some of the most freeing information a person can give. I'm in sales and I had somebody tell me this a long time ago. If you're in a meeting and you don't know, the worst thing you can do is try to make something up or try to pretend like you know. It's like, just simply say, I don't know, but I'm happy to go try to find out the answer. So that I don't know can then have one of two things. I don't know and let me research and get back to you. Or I don't know, this probably needs something from a professional. You might want to go consider talking with somebody else. How can I help? So it's not, I don't know, I'm not going to do anything, but I don't know, how can I help? But I would encourage us to consider, are we an expert? If so, if it's in your lane, great. Listen, really listen, and then counsel. If not, say, I don't know, to see if we can help. The third and final point on counselor, ask questions and shoot straight. Ask questions and shoot straight. An example I'd like to highlight here is in Exodus. Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18 and verse 13. Story of Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro. On verse 13, and so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. The people stood before Moses from morning until evening. <coughs> So here's Moses, and there's a line of people knocking at Moses' tent door. I'm guessing it was a tent door or a flap or wherever he was setting up for the day. But there was a line of people, and that line went forever. And it was morning to night, and everybody's coming through. Hey, Moses, I need help with this. Hey, Moses, what do you think about that? Hey, Moses, how tiring would that be all day? So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, so at this point, Moses didn't go to his father-in-law and say, hey, Jethro, what do you think would be a better idea? Interesting here, Jethro asked the question, what is this thing that you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? Now, I will give a, a big credit to both my in-laws and my mom and, and uh, former dad. Adult children don't really want to have people tell them a lot they need to do. So you want to be careful with when you're giving advice. You want to be thoughtful if you're, you know, how that's handled. But in this case, Jethro, he asked questions and then he shot straight. So here he is. What's this thing you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, well, it's because people keep coming to me. They're inquiring of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me. I judge from one to the other. I make known the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law shot straight. The thing that you do is not good. Moses, you've helped a lot of people. Those people were in line all day, every day. But this path, not the right path. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You're not able to perform it by yourself. So listen now to my voice. This is Jethro speaking. I'll give you counsel. God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the ways and show them the way in which they may, must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. And then it shall be every great matter that they shall bring to you. Every small matter, let them take care of it. Let them judge those things. So it will be much easier for you. They will bear the burden with you. Whenever I see the, the rulers of thousands, hundreds of tens, anybody that goes way, way back to Big Sandy and the feast, that was how the feast in the Piney Woods was set up. But the thinking of delegation, Moses, you can't do all of this yourself. You can't, you're going to wear yourself out. Delegate, find other people to help around you to be able to do this. So it's very wise advice given from Jethro. But it was interesting, what I'm highlighting here is Moses didn't come to him for advice. He asked questions. He then shot straight. But let's be very, very careful if we're trying to then go to somebody to say, oh, I have exactly what you need to be doing or considering. So that's a... a needs to be very uh, thoughtfully done. 
A couple of uh, uh, closing con concepts here. We need to speak the truth in love. So Jethro, I'm not sure if this is translated exactly like Jethro said. That thing you do is not good. It's almost like he's, well, Moses, you're a fool. You're being <laughs> foolish. Uh, who knows what the translation was like or what that exact term was. But for us, if we're in a situation that we're giving counsel or advice, we need to listen, consider for an expert, and we need to speak the truth in love. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 24 will be our last scripture. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 24. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. So if we have the opportunity to listen and to give advice, considering we're an expert, we can ask questions and shoot straight, speak the truth with love, but also remember, pleasant words are like the honeycomb. There's an old book, many of you probably know, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I went to the Dale Carnegie sales training class. It's one I'd recommend if anybody would be in sales. Uh, just to think about basic human relations and people skills, we should be kind to each other. Kind words are like honeycomb. When I think of honeycomb, I think of growing up, we would ride the bus home. And there was a time when we would all ride the same bus, like three siblings and me. And mom used to make bread. And there was some fresh honey and butter on warm bread coming out of the oven. And I can still, in my mind's eye, picture and imagine the bread and the smell coming out of the oven with the honeycomb and the butter and just, it was just, there's like warmth and love that's just wrapped into that. So when I see pleasant words are like the honeycomb, that's what comes to mind for me. But as we have an opportunity to help counsel or encourage others, consider the words that we would use, speak them in love, and consider that pleasant words are like the honeycomb. Not everything we can say is always pleasant. We need to be accurate. We need to be helpful. But if you can think of a honeycomb wrapper, then that would be a positive. So in conclusion, there's much to consider with the counselor, the counselee, and responsibility for all. From a counselee perspective, remember to seek an expert or experts. It's okay to consider a lot or maybe not. Seek counsel, but not agreement. But not shopping for somebody to just match an answer. Seek counsel, not agreement, and then listen, consider, and then choose to apply if it makes sense. From a counselor perspective, listen, really listen. Consider if you're an expert, and then ask questions and shoot straight with honeycomb.